This is Professor Lisa Taylor, and this is my um, lecture for my civil procedure students that introduces the concepts of basic pleading, their historical antecedents, and the modern notice pleading standard under the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. So first, what are pleadings? Um, pleadings are the papers filed at the outset of a lawsuit that identify or describe the party's claims and defenses. And these can include a complaint, typically filed by the plaintiff, and an answer, the paper filed by the defendant, and the defendant's answer, in addition to um, responding to the plaintiff's allegations and asserting any defenses that the defendant may have, also um, can include additional claims, counterclaims back against the plaintiff, cross-claims against co-parties, co-defendants, or third-party claims against um, third parties, as the name suggests. And we'll be talking about all those kinds of claims in much more detail when we get to joinder of claims and parties in this course. Uh, in addition, a third type of, of uh, pleading is a reply, which, as Rule 7 indicates, is relatively rare and allowed only when the court orders one. So the main types of pleadings we're going to be focusing on are complaints and answers. Um, but then any version of these uh, pleadings can also be amended. And we'll be talking about amended pleadings as well. Throughout this course, we've talked about um, the sources of governing law that govern um, procedure. And in this part of the course that govern that we when we're going to be talking through the litigation process, we're going to be focusing um, a lot of attention on the federal rules of civil procedure. So it's very important as we embark upon this portion of the course that is so heavily focused on the federal rules of civil procedure that you make it a habit starting now uh, to read the rules and then reread them and then reread them again and read them very carefully. Reading the rules um, carefully cannot be overemphasized. So um, right now in this part of the lecture I'm going to list for you some of the rules that govern pleadings and I'd like for you to um, pause the video as needed to go look in your rule book at the, the rules in particular that I'm listing. Read through those rules now make a note of any of the uh, what you see as the more important parts and be generally begin to become familiar with the structure and content of these rules. So first is Rule 7a. It lists what types of pleadings are allowed. Rule 8 prescribes the governing standards. We've looked um, some in some detail already at Rule 8a2. And there are also other provisions of Rule 8 that um, govern the content of other types of pleadings, including the answer. Rule 9 governs pleading special matters, and in particular we'll focus on Rule 9b pertaining to allegations of fraud or mistake, which, as that rule indicates, must be pleaded with particularity. We'll also be talking in some detail, as we've already mentioned before, about um, Rule 12, which provides the mechanism for challenging a pleading. And there are a number of mechanisms for challenging pleadings set forth in Rule 12. We'll begin by focusing on Rule 12b-6, um, but if you read through the entirety of Rule 12 now, you'll find that um, there are a number of other mechanisms for challenging pleadings there as well. And then Rule 15, which governs amended pleadings. And as you read through that rule, you'll see that um, there are a number of requirements about when and how pleadings can be amended. And then finally, Rule 11, which governs care and candor, which is another word for truthfulness in pleadings as well as other papers that are filed in the court. So what is the purpose of pleadings? It's important to think about what purpose we want pleadings to serve because the purpose that the pleadings are intended to serve can inform um, what the rules mean um, as far as what uh, what is required for the pleadings. And um, we'll see this when we talk in a minute about the historical antecedents, but depending on the purpose, um, what purpose the, the sort of rule drafters or rule makers wanted the pleadings to serve, that informed then or uh, affected what sort of rule the rule drafters drafted, so to speak. So under our current system, the purpose seems to be primarily to give notice, um, although as we'll also see, there is some provision for stating facts, making the facts known to the parties, another 
function of the notice giving, and to some extent to narrow the issues so that we know what it is. Is this a claim of negligence? Is this a claim of breach of contract? What, what kinds of issues are there going to be um, to be resolved in this case? It's also important to understand at the outset where pleadings lie in the context of a lawsuit. And our study in this next section of the course will roughly track the chronology of a lawsuit. So we were beginning with pleadings, which are usually filed at the outset, although amended pleadings could be filed at other times um, later in the lawsuit, as we'll see when we study Rule 15. After the pleadings then typically is the lengthiest part of a lawsuit, which is the discovery period where Information ex is exchanged as by asking questions in writing, asking questions in person in a deposition, um, producing or exchanging documents um, to one another, much of which is now electronic, um, and uh, um, other forms of discovery, physical examinations and, and such, which all of which we will talk about in more detail when we get to that portion of the course. Then there's the summary judgment phase, which I give special treatment to here for several reasons. One is that um, although not always, it is often a sort of separate and distinct phase in the chronology of a lawsuit um, that follows discovery and precedes any trial, should there be one in a case. Um, and because I think it's a very important part of our modern federal rules of civil procedure, and you'll come to understand that as we work through the pleading requirements, the role of discovery, and then eventually come to our discussion of summary judgment itself. And then finally, the, the final quote unquote stage of litigation would be the trial, although um, as we've said and we'll continue to see throughout our study this, uh, this semester that um, many cases do not end in a trial. They're either settled or resolved in some other way as by summary judgment or some other motion without ever there being a need for trial. So your text includes some discussion of the historical antecedents of um, pleadings and I think that's an important um, it's, a, it's helpful to you to understand where we are today in order to, by viewing it through the lens of where we've come from. So you better understand where we are today by examining where we've been. So initially our common law system, we followed the common law system of England, which um, utilized forms of writs and rigidity was the hallmark of that system. Um, the goal was Issue narrowing, um, but as the text explains, if the writs didn't comply with very strict requirements, then um, the claim would not succeed. Um, so in an effort to sort of get away from that, a few alternatives were developed. First was equity, which actually developed back in England as well, um, which allowed for forms of relief other than those that the common law writs would have allowed for, including um, uh, injunctions or other forms of specific relief like specific performance and so on. And then some codes were adopted um, in an effort to get away from the rigidity of the common law writs and the um, equity system. And the emphasis there was on fact pleading. Um, emphasis on facts to weed out legal, legally insufficient claims and defenses. Um, but many conceived of the codes as placing too much emphasis on facts, requiring that a plaintiff include too many facts. And so the modern system was developed as adopted in 1938 via the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. And as we've pointed out before, the central applicable provision there is Rule 8A2, which requires a short and plain statement of the claim showing that the pleader is entitled to relief. The goal, as the text explains, and as we'll talk about regularly, uh, was simply one of providing notice. Put the parties and the court and maybe the public, should there be anyone interested in it, on notice of what the claims are and um, a, a sort of basic uh, foundation for those claims. question then, of course, became, well, what, what is enough to, to, to provide that level of notice? And we'll be talking about that in some detail in class. Um, as we work through our discussion of pleadings. And note that that goal of notice um, was reflected throughout the structure of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. So the pleadings were intended only to provide notice because the discovery process, which was um, conceived as very broad and liberal, um, was where all the facts would be exchanged. And um, so there were uh, relatively um, uh, 
you know, the limits on discovery were, were not very substantial. So discovery was um, to be very broad then, and that's when all the facts should come out. They didn't need to be come out in the pleadings, unlike the code pleading system, and that there was going to be this uh, summary judgment function that would be available to weed out meritless claims. Um, and so that didn't need to be served, that goal didn't need to be served by um, the pleadings either. So the pleadings only needed to serve the goal of notice because discovery served the goal of exchange of facts and the summary judgment mechanism would weed out meritless claims. So what is the notice pleading standard? What is required? Well, we've said Rule 8A2 is the um, central governing provision, a short and plain statement of the claim showing that the pleader is entitled to relief. But in order to understand um, what that means, I think it's important to view it through the lens of the mechanism for challenging a complaint, which is Rule 12b-6, that if a complaint fails to state a claim upon which relief can be granted, then it has not met the standard of Rule 8a-2 or vice versa. A complaint that does not contain a short and plain statement of the claim showing that the pleader is entitled to relief has by its nature, failed to state a claim upon which relief can be granted. So those two rules really go hand in hand in this context. And I think it's important at the outset to take note of um, the point made in your text uh, and repeated several times, and you can take note of this in note six in particular, that um, the court initially in Conley versus Gibson interpreted that um, standard to mean that a complaint should not be dismissed for failure to state a claim unless it appears beyond doubt that the plaintiff can prove no set of facts that would entitle him to relief. We'll be revisiting that standard a number of times, so please make a note of it. Um, in particular, we'll be talking through in class the uh, variations on um, a variety of complaints that are set forth in uh, note 7 on page 427, so uh, Take a look at those as you prepare for class. Um, a few points about notice pleading before I end this lecture. Um, one is, as the text indicates, the importance of the substantive law. Even though this is a course on procedure, you can't examine whether the procedural rules have been complied with without having some understanding of the substantive law that is invoked. And here's an example of what I mean by that. So you've got two main cases here in this first part of the pleadings section in your text. One is Diagordi versus Durning, which is a Second Circuit case in 1944. Part of the reason that that's included, even though it's not a Supreme Court case, is that it provides a good example of the um, liberal pleading standard um, that was initially crafted under the federal rules. And it's um, particularly notable because the author of that um, opinion, Judge Clark, was also one of the authors of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. He was on the advisory committee that drafted the initial set of rules adopted in 1938. <clears throat> so his view of what the rules required, as pronounced in Diagordi versus Durning, was deemed to be very instructive. So um, in terms of the importance of substantive law, then, you, you can see that reflected in Diagordi versus Durning. Um, go back to that case and um, look at how it was that the um, Court of Appeals decided to reverse the trial court's dismissal. Why was it that, according to the Court of Appeals, the trial court was wrong to dismiss the case? Well, for one thing, the Court of Appeals said that the trial court applied too exacting of a standard, that um, the pleading requirement does not demand facts sufficient to constitute a cause of action, but only that there be a short and plain statement of the claim showing that the pleader is entitled to relief. So for one thing, the appeals court said that the trial court was uh, wrong in um, its uh, application of the standard. And, but then beyond that, and more importantly, um, the court found a sufficient basis to support claims under the governing substantive law. And in particular, as the notes after the case point out, um, the court there found that there were sufficient allegations to state a claim for conversion as well as one for violation of the statute 19 U.S.C. section 1491 that's cited in the case. 
Similarly, you can see the same um, reflection of the importance of substantive law and Doe versus Smith. And we're going to talk about this in class, but um, as you prepare for that, look back at the Doe versus Smith case and then at the notes following it um, to try to discern what it is that the plaintiff Doe needed to plead in order to state her claim sufficiently under the governing rules. And then look at the allegations themselves and see if you can figure out how and where the plaintiff met that standard as we know that the court ultimately held. Um, so break down the statute. What is it that the plaintiff uh, must plead? Another important point that I want you to take away uh, from your reading as you prepare for class is that in um, the context of pleadings, uh, on our notice pleading standard, factual disputes are irrelevant. It doesn't matter if the defendant completely disagrees with every fact alleged in the plaintiff's complaint, that's not going to be a grounds for dismissal at this stage. The pleading itself can still be sufficient. So the facts in the complaint, as you'll see um, courts state over and over, are taken as true. You can see that in the Diaboridi versus Durning case itself, for one thing, um, as well as in, um, uh, let's see, note four after the case. It says the facts need to be taken as true. Whether if they were true, they would entitle the pleader to relief under the substantive law. That's the standard. So take those facts as true, then examine whether the plaintiff has um, stated a claim uh, for relief. You see the same reflection of that same idea in Doe versus Smith. And in fact, any case that you looked at that examined a challenge to a, to a complaint on the grounds that the pleading was insufficient is going to take the facts in the complaint as true. So what if a defendant disputes the facts then? And certainly that might be the case in many cases. A defendant might disagree with the plaintiff's version of the facts, right? Well, that may well, that's all fine and good, but that is not a basis on which to challenge a pleading under Rule 12b-6. Instead, a dispute of facts, um, any effort to dispute a facts is going to uh, require that the court convert any motion to dismiss on those grounds to a motion for summary judgment that a, um, for instance, should uh, defendant Smith and Doe versus Smith come back and say, um, no, I didn't record anything in our bedroom when I was with her, the plaintiff. Um, that's his ver different version of the facts, and that can only be a basis for getting the case dismissed on a motion for summary judgment, not on a motion directed to the pleadings, because again, the facts in the complaint are to be taken as true. So um, I'm going to direct your attention in this regard to Federal Rule 12D. 12D says, um, if on a motion under 12B6 or 12C, matters outside the pleadings are presented to and not excluded by the court, the motion must be treated as one for summary judgment under Rule 56. So um, we'll be coming back to that from time to time, and you should be sure to take a note of it, as well as note five after the Diagordi decision also makes this point um, that if there is a dispute of the factual allegations, then that can't be resolved on a 12b6 motion. It would have to be resolved, if at all, on a motion for summary judgment. All right, last point um, in this lecture is that there are two types of challenges, and we'll be talking about this in class in more detail, but I want to introduce you to this concept now, um, that we're going to be focusing more, uh, particularly when we get to the second section of, or the second half of the basic pleading chapter, the Twombly and Iqbal cases, on, uh, we're going to be focusing then on challenges to complaints for failure to plead sufficient detail, which I call a pleading challenge. Um, but there's another kind of 12b6 motion that can also um, be filed, and that is one which challenges a complaint on grounds that the law does not support the claims pled, and I call that a legal challenge. And I am directed you here to Doe versus Smith because the court actually draws this distinction in that case between the types of motions. So on page 436 in the Doe decision, um, the court says that um, litigants may plead themselves out of court by alleging facts that defeat recovery. 
um, complaints now be dismissed and they show that the defendant did no wrong. For example, a complaint alleging that a sports team violated the antitrust laws by restricting peanut sales on the stadium's grounds is defective because the antitrust laws do not entitle one person to sell goods on someone else's property. Um, and then the court goes on to say that that's not what she, that she hasn't done that here. Doe has not pleaded herself out of court. None of her allegations show that, that Smith is sure, sure to succeed. Um, you know, if, for instance, she had alleged that um, their uh, tryst in the bedroom was entirely silent, that no one made a sound, that might have been an allegation that would have pleaded her out of court because, as we know from the court's discussion of the statute, some oral communication, interception of an oral communication is required. Had there been no oral communication, then she would not have been able to prevail on her claim. So we're going to be talking about the difference between those two types of challenges to pleadings as we work through um, uh, this material as well. So take a look at that material. Uh, all right, well, um, we will be ready then after you've studied this video and the material in the text uh, to begin our discussion of basic pleadings and um, I will look forward to that with you then.